we want to use this experience to encourage others to get help and also to to try and end the stigma which is huge isn't it because whilst there's a stigma people aren't going to reach out they're not going to ask for help so i think by by me talking about our experience it shows that there's nothing to be ashamed of i'm, I'm not i mean i put a tweet up this morning it's gone viral but just saying i'm, I'm not embarrassed by what chris did i'm not ashamed of him it i'm sad obviously that he he didn't get the help that he so desperately needed but by talking about what we're going through and the effects it's had on us i hope that that will make other people think you know i i can't do this to my family i need to go out there and get help should we, we i mean we're already recording but normally i snip the start off because we're, we're talking you're, you're happy to just crack on now yeah yeah, it's yeah. Fine. i mean it, it, there's, there's nothing I'm not willing to talk about, to be honest. I'll talk about my career in the forces, how we met, what life was like, because even before we separated, life was quite horrendous at times. And it's, it's them, it, it's the signs and symptoms, isn't it? It's that other people choose to ignore. Yeah, and you, you've got, um, you've got a, um, an unusual perspective of it as well, Mandy, in that you're ex-military yourself you know um and perhaps that makes it easier or more difficult to deal with what went on i don't know but could so you were raf police right yeah okay um we should get straight into it we, we, you you mentioned about the stigma just now around mental health and uh and what what looking back what's your experience of of it when you were serving um, the mental health topic uh, um, when you're serving, plus for the RAF and as a female. Um, and I, I, the reason I point out, you know, that is that it is it only is it only, is the stigma only around uh, mo most prevalent around men because of the old uh, macho thing, or or is it the same with women? Um, what's your just talk to me? What's your experiences of that stigma that you talk about? Um, I I think. Because I, I joined when the stigma was still very much saying, oh, you just need to man up. Um, when I got injured in Iraq in 2007, and I came home from there, and I was struggling hugely mentally. Um, I was lucky that my flight sergeant actually dragged me in the office and told me if I didn't get help and go to the med centre, then he would sign me off work. Um, so in that respect, you know, he, he probably saved me from what he did that day. But I was very much of the mindset. I'm, I was a dog handler. I was the only female in the section. I didn't want to look weak in front of my colleagues. And that was exactly why I didn't reach out. And I believe even to this day, I mean, that was 14 years ago. People are still very much of the opinion they don't want to look weak. Um, maybe as a female it was harder in some ways to actually you know you, you do all you can do to gain the respect of your male colleagues because let's be honest it's a very male orientated job um sometimes depending on who you work, work with you have to try that little bit harder to be accepted into that role um, so I, I think that's why I struggled. I didn't want to lose the respect to my colleagues. Now, as it turned out, they had more respect for me for actually reaching out and saying, you know, I, I don't think I can do this. It's, and like everyone else, I turned to other things. I turned to alcohol, um, which had to soon stop because as we found out three months down the line after me getting arrow medded home, when I got in, I'd only been in theatre for a week when I got injured, which I've never quite heard the end of. Um, I was actually two weeks pregnant with Jay. You found out subsequently? But yeah, I found out three months after coming home because obviously people say, oh, did you not notice, had your monthlies not stopped? And yes, they had, but I put that down to stress. I'd, I'd just been through a horrific experience. 
Oh my God, the phone's ringing, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Give me two seconds. That's a crate. <laughs> Don't say anything dodgy. Don't say anything dodgy, man. We can hear you talking. <laughs> sorry, it was Chris's dash. <laughs> Go on, you 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 were saying. Um yeah, so I I then found out that I was pregnant. Obviously completely worried. I'd I'd had all these x rays, I'd had morphine on coming home because they couldn't believe I'd only broken my arm and I hadn't broken anything else. Um so that that sort of sorted my head out because I had something else to focus on. But I I will be the first to admit I, I played the counsellor because I realised what he wanted me to say quite early on. And I made sure after a couple of weeks of seeing him, I said what he wanted to hear. Um, so, and he was under the impression that I was cured. It's, and that, that's how much it's changed because now obviously we realise you can manage PTSD and you can find ways to, for maybe not to affect you as much as it once did. I don't think we ever get cured of PTSD. And that, that's just one way that things have changed. Because, you know, he discharged me and was under the impression that I was fine. I could go back off. I went back onto armed duty. And it was, which, I mean, a female with a weapon anyway, probably not advisable some nights. <laughs> but... But yeah, I mean that that's just how it's changed for me. I've I haven't got it half as bad as what some people have it. And I know that, I know I'm lucky. Um I just suffer hugely with anxiety and paranoia. It's and that that was maybe made worse by some of the trauma I went through with Chris. But I've I've learned to deal with it. It's so still sometimes it sneaks up on you and I I still have bad days where I think the whole world is against me. But it, it's something I've learned, learned to live with sort of 14 years down the line. And I have a lot more, I try to focus on other things. I try to pull myself away from what's going on with me. And what's helped me more than anything is helping other people. Mm -hmm. um, why do you... <clears throat> Um, why do you say that you th you think it's yeah, PTSD is something you can never get away from? Generally, curable. What's led I, you to I think, think that? I I just think I mean you can you can get help, and obviously help is such a good thing to do. But I, I think that having spoken to quite a few people that have got PTSD. I, I think it's just something that's always there. I'm, I may be completely wrong. There could be someone come on that completely throws what I've just said out of the water. But I, I just think when you go through a trauma that is so bad to cause the, the ripple effect of what PTSD does, although you can manage it, I think it's always there. I don't think that trauma ever... Oh, you're frozen. You froze there. Okay. Yes, yeah, so, so you're right now. It's fine. No, the, the reason I ask is that uh, uh, you, you've heard me talk about it before, Mandy Bostwick, Mark Gordon, and um, I'm, you may be right. You may be absolutely right. You can't ever get away, fully get away from the, the effects of it. But um, from from their perspective, the one of the areas that there's an area that gets uh, unchecked, unassessed, untreated to do with traumatic events and the impacts and that's the this the sort of physical effects on the brain the neuroendocrinology the hormonal imbalance that's caused by traumatic events and one of the things they're trying to do is over here in the uk and state and everywhere really is bring that part of it in so as as part of a an assessment and treatment of someone who's got a mental who's mentally ill in some way shape or form or mildly or majorly you know anxiety depression ptsd whatever is that they want they want as part of that immediate conversation to be okay let's look at the psychiatry side let's also look at 
the the brain the what it's doing what what isn't functioning properly in the brain what uh, again what hormone hormone imbalances are there and treat that side too so let's get the brain all of the, all of the bits and bobs and chemicals it needs in the right proportions to function properly on that front and then that will also that will contribute to helping to fix the psychiatry side of things those you know emotional symptoms if you like um yeah. and yeah you know, I, I, I can't argue with that really but what it what it what it what it is a good indication of that and that may not be the case for everyone right you know but what is a good indication is that there's 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 further opportunity there to to Im- improve the mental health they you know in people that have otherwise left that side unchecked that neuroendocrinology side of things but when did you when did you get out there monday when did you leave the area um i left 2009 so um chris chris came home one day in the summer i think it was a july um and said oh i'm posted to germany which i was like all right well that's lovely um i couldn't i couldn't get posted to germany in my role um so i was straight in with the bosses and again very lucky i got a short uh, quick release date so actually when it came to the october we were able to move over there as a family i mean jay was 18 months old at the time and there was no way that I were Chris in Germany and us still in Kings Lynn. It's, which, I mean, it, it was a shame and I'll, I'll never regret leaving because I left for my family. But I, I do still miss it to this day, I have to admit. I miss the banter, I miss the friendships you had. I mean, the friendships don't die, do they, when you leave? that they're maybe not the same as they once were but when I left I I felt like I lost part of my identity I lost who I was because I went into the scenario of being an army wife so I was Chris's wife or I was Jay's mum I'd actually lost Mandy in the whole scheme of sort of leaving and then going into this new role as an army wife Um, how did you, how did you deal with that as it, as it went forward? How long were you in Germany for? Uh, just under four years, which was absolutely amazing. Um, for the first few months I struggled. Um, it was the first time in years I hadn't worked, although I was loving being at home with Jay and you, you can never get that time back. Can you, when they're so young and you actually get to spend all day, every day with them. And that was amazing. Um, having Chris a five minute walk away from the house was amazing instead of sort of a two hour drive which is what we were doing in the UK um and life to start with was awesome you know we had all this family time together and picnics in the park obviously exploring Germany um and just the simple things just sitting down to tea together and sort of at the weekend if Chris was off we were able to have a barbecue and there was no stress about him having to have an early night to get up for work. It, it was proper family life, which was awesome. Not to say that doesn't go with, without any problems in the same as any marriage. It's, I mean, it, it's stressful enough moving to a different country, I think, when you're leaving behind your friends, your family. And because he was attached um, as RLC, it, it's hard because all these families have been together for years and all of a sudden you're trying to join that you're trying to make friends i think it was a lot easier having jay because we could go to like mums and tots and things like that and you met people that way but i mean I, I loved the life out there but it can be very very clicky can't it and it's and i think that's something a lot of wives will sort of agree with but when, once you find an in, then life becomes a lot easier. But I mean, Chris was already struggling at that point. Not, not to a huge degree, but he'd, he'd done numerous tours of Bosnia, Kosovo. He'd done Northern Ireland. He'd done Sierra Leone, which I think are so often the forgotten wars, aren't they? 
and he was already struggling with some of the things he'd seen out there. And the big thing that I have to get across with him is people say, oh, but he was only a chef. Uh, you know, he was trained as a chef, but he was a soldier first. And a lot of people would tell you he was always the first to say that he would go out and patrol with a foot patrol, vehicle patrol. And he would throw himself into every single tour. And, you know, it, it's quite annoying when people brand people by their trade or by the regiments. And it's, you know, we're, we're all trained to be soldiers first, weren't we? No matter what your trade was. Mm -hmm. Did, so when did was things difficult for him at the same time as they were for you so you mentioned he was he was struggling at that point but years so the years before that you were you had, you'd had your issues getting injured in iraq and then get sent back and and then the ptsd there how what was that situation like yeah i mean chris was chris he wasn't the most sympathetic um it's he, he was very much of the the era man up and that was what i was told on numerous occasions um we did come to blows over it a few times because although i would never go out seeking sympathy maybe a little bit of sympathy would have been nice here and there um but i mean he was struggling his own demons at the time he he dealt with it in in the ways that he wanted to and that was mainly by trying to push it into a box and not deal with it um but i mean we got through it it's it, there was some big arguments there were small arguments but at the end of the day you know i think we all deal with it in a way that helps us he, he thought he was helping me by telling me to man up thinking that would give me a kick up the ass maybe and but sometimes that's just not the way People need, I, I needed maybe a softer hand, sort of someone to guide me through it, not someone to try and force me to go through that journey by myself. Yeah, that's the, that's the difficulty, isn't it? It's, the, it's, different, it's different approaches with different people. The same approach doesn't work for everyone, right? And um, uh, yeah, and that half the challenge is finding out what does work, I suppose. Um, was he aware we that he was it. sorry say that again sorry we don't even we don't always know what the best approach is to help <laughs> ourselves so yeah. it's yeah it's difficult was he aware that he was uh getting worse with it i mean what what when what was the situation with him but was it you know how do you, how could you tell that things were getting worse with him um anger mainly and when he lost his temper, especially after his last tour of Afghan, but as well leading up to it, um, when, when he would shout at you, scream and shout, then his eyes would be vacant. And it was, it was like he wasn't there, he wasn't stood in front of you, he was hundreds of miles away. So, and I think it's that old saying, isn't it? It's the red mist coming down. But... Any, anything we, we said, including Jay, it was like walking on eggshells because anything could set him off. You could say the most innocent thing and it would be like you were digging at him or you were calling him out for something and you weren't. It, it was just a normal conversation. Um, the, I mean, the big indicator for me with Chris was he stepped up his drinking hugely. He, he would think nothing of coming home and drinking a slab of lager as in 24 cans of lager and he would stay up for as long as it meant that he could drink that and that was the only way he could sleep i think because he, he would go to sleep and there would be nightmares whereas when he drank there didn't seem to be the nightmares so it, it's like you're drinking yourself unconscious aren't you um he would he was always a big smoker he was talking to other women on the internet and it, it was just like a escape route for him 
it, I don't think nothing that he did he didn't do on purpose to hurt me or to hurt Jay but he was trying to escape what was going on in his own mind and even gambling I mean fruit machine he would think nothing to put in 300 pounds in a fruit machine but then that was followed by all the lies. I mean, so many times he told me that he booked us on a holiday and that was why 300 pounds was gone out of the bank account. And I'm still waiting for that holiday. It's, but it's, and it, they're all signs and symptoms, aren't they? And it, it's, what we need to do is educate people on what to look out for. Because we've, we've all been there, we've all been in the mess when you've seen someone piling pound after pound into a fruit machine. And it's always the same faces, but we don't necessarily think anything of it. But it's the same as anything with the alcohol, with the cigarettes, the women, it's all a form of addiction, isn't it? And we use addiction to escape real life. Yeah, it's a diversion of, of focus or something to occupy your mind other than the thing that you don't want to occupy your mind. You know, I, I know a few people and I want a particular, and you'll go through cycles of exactly like you said there, gambling, or it'll be substance abuse. But it's not, not all at the same time. It'll be like no. six six months, twelve months of substance abuse. Like Jesus, man, and then it, and then it'll and then it'll get off that. It'll give it, get you know, its situation will improve, and then and then he'll just hit the next. He'll hit the next trough in his you know in his in his life, and it'll something it'll it'll just set him off, and then it's six months 12 months of gambling and then he's skint and then it's you know and then he's in a massive hole financially and then it's like get get out of that and then it'll be something else you know um yeah it's, it's a vicious circle isn't it i mean I've, I've even after everything chris did to me I've, I've never been in any doubt that he loved me i think maybe it scared him that i knew him so well and I could see through him. It's, and by that, I mean, I could, I could see that he was struggling and he knew that I would be the one person that would force his hand and try and get him to have help. Whereas if he, if he spoke to all these other women, he could put on this, you know, it's like an internet date and isn't it? You can be whoever you want to be. You don't have to say the bad side of you. You don't have to say what you're feeling. You just give over this image of the perfect man. And that that helped him because then he was getting the right sort of attention from these women. Whereas with me, I, I was constantly bringing up, you know, you're struggling, we need to get you help. And by doing that, it was making him face these demons and he didn't want to do that. Did he ever? Did did you ever make any headway trying to? Uh, I think getting him in front of someone or to 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 talk about it. Or find yeah, out we did. Um, we, I mean, we separated in two thousand and fifteen because things had turned not just mental abuse. There was physical abuse in there as well. Um, it wasn't a life I wanted to bring Jay up around. But that said, I still wanted him to have a relationship with his dad, obviously. Um, and in the February of 2016, I went up to Durham to pick up some of Jay's things that he'd left behind, all his toys and such like. And actually, me and Chris sat down and we spoke for two hours. And it was, for that two hours, it was like I had my old Chris back. I had the Chris back that I'd fallen in love with. We were smiling, we were laughing. There was tears, but they weren't angry tears. Um, he admitted to me then that he, he needed help and that he wanted help. Um, I said to him that it had to be him. He had to be the one that reached out and asked for that help. But no matter what, what had happened between us, I would always love him and I would always help him. Um, and I left there to come home and I felt like a huge weight had been lifted. You know, I'd, he'd opened the door, just that sliver for me. And he'd let me in, which is something he hadn't let me do in years. Um, and I honestly believe that he would take that next step and he would go out and seek help. 
I mean, we spoke about all the people he could go to, whether it was his GP to one of the many forces charities. And I, uh, looking back, maybe I was naive, but I, I honestly believed that he was going to get help and we were going to get our old Chris back. Two seconds. What's up? Yes. Okay. Sorry. No, it's fine. It's fine. Um, so, so what happened after that conversation then? Um, what didn't happen? <laughs> well, yeah. I, I didn't speak to him um, for a few months. It's, he promised me that he was going to pick up the phone and speak to Jay because that relationship had broken down somewhat because Chris was distancing himself from us. Um, it, it was like he didn't want to hurt us anymore. And that's exactly what Jay said one day after, after Chris died. He said, you know, maybe daddy's done this so that he doesn't hurt us anymore. And the insight for that to come out of, I think Jay was nine at the time, is just absolutely amazing. And, it, and it's something that rings true. So a few months down the line, I sent Chris a text message just saying, you know, how are you doing? Um, have you managed to get help? Is it helping you? How do you feel? Um, and he actually sent back a text. It was the last text I ever had from him um, saying that the person he was seeing at the time had told him he would look weak if he asked for help. And unfortunately, what she said was gospel. She said, sorry, what did she say to him? She said that if he asked for help, he would look weak. Why did she say that? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't get it. Oh, hang on. This isn't, this is, oh, it was a woman just around. Oh, okay. I, when you said the person you were speaking to, I thought you meant like a counsellor or something. Right, oh, no, okay. no. The, the woman he was seeing at the time God, had said that to him. Which, um, I had no words, you know, I, I tried to convince him, but I never heard from him again until um, I got the phone call from his stepbrother um, telling me that he'd taken his own life. And from that, I mean, when I, I went up to Durham to ID his body, because um, obviously I was still legally his wife, still next to kin, and I, I wanted to do that. I wanted to see Chris. I wanted to say goodbye. And although I'm not religious, <laughs> I wanted to be able to send him on, knowing that I'd forgiven everything and there was no no problems between us. You know, I hold no grudges. I'm not bitter towards what happened, but I wanted to be the person to do that. Um, and whilst up there, we we got. I spoke to the policeman or the DC that was dealing with his case. Um, and he told me some of the text messages that were found on his phone. Now, Chris was found on the Tuesday, um, which was the 29th, because he hadn't turned up for work. But actually, on the Sunday, who with? Yeah. So sorry. Fine. So actually, on the Sunday, he had sent to the same person a picture of a homemade noose in place saying that he was going to kill himself. Um, the only reply he got back was do it then because the world would be a better place without you in it. Um, no, no help was called. Um, she, she didn't feel that was important enough to notify anyone that he was obviously in crisis. Um, and the police even said to this day, you know, even if they'd gone round and he was just sat on the sofa with a can of beer, you know, they would have done a welfare check. It, it's, they would rather go round and check and he's fine than for obviously the worst to have happened. So we don't actually know when he took his own life. It could have been any time between then and Tuesday. But... What what breaks my heart is, I honestly believe he would he would have sat there, 
and waited for someone to come around for it to show that someone cared. And I think that's what really hurts is that when he died, he maybe thought that nobody cared about him. And that, that just couldn't be further from the truth, you know. Not only was he the father of our son, he, he was the man that I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life with. I loved him deeply and part of me will always love him because of who he is. You know, Jay, Jay Hero worships him, you know, as, as boys do with their dads. And I mean, we're, we're just two people. He had family members, he had his mum, he had his dad. He had so many friends and the ripple effect from what he, he did has been massive. And it doesn't just affect me and Jay, it affects so many other people. And, but the thought that he maybe thought that nobody cared just absolutely breaks my heart. And that, that's probably the hardest thing I find to deal with about all of this. And to be that low and think that no, nobody in this world cares about you. I mean, it couldn't be further from the truth. We all, we all go through times where we think, oh, you know, I've messed up and nobody would give a flying frig if something happened to me. And it's, it's just not the truth. There's always someone out there that cares. Yeah, the problem is you get tunnel vision, don't you? I think as you, whatever, whatever the cause is, as your mental health declines um, in, in a lot of circumstances, you get tunnel vision and you, you lose a rational sense of the world around you and the environment around you and the people who, who know you and love you, you know. Um, and, and to actually, to do, to do something like that, then your mind has got to be so far gone, isn't it? Because we, we all know how precious life is. And I, I couldn't do it. I'm, it's not something I could do. What winds me up is when people call him a coward. Because you're not a coward, you're not selfish. It's If your mind is telling you that the only way out of your problems is to do that, then you are so far gone. And to actually have people stamp all over his memory by calling him names, I feel like it's disgusting, absolutely disgusting. It, although, I mean, suicide is never the answer, never. It's, it's a permanent solution to a temporary problem, isn't it? But people that do it aren't cowards. It's, and that, that's something huge because that doesn't help the families left behind, doesn't help the friends left behind. It's, you know, suicide is such a horrendous way to lose someone. And you question everything you've done in those months leading up to it. If I'd done something differently, would he still be here? If I'd gone back to him when he asked me, would he still be here? But you know, my, my conscience is clear. I did every single thing I did for a reason. I mean, I left him be because of my mental health. Because when you're being physically attacked on a regular basis, when you're being verbally attacked day in, day out, being told that you're fat, being told that you're ugly, nobody else will ever want you. I could feel my mental health declining at a rapid rate. And also for Jay's mental health, you know, he, he wasn't daft. He was seven when, when we left and he knew that things were horrendous between us. You know, he, he would get up in the morning and he would see the sort of state of things from the night before. You know, I tried to hide so much from Jay. I would get up early and clear away all the beer cans so he didn't know that daddy had been awake all night just drinking. I would move the blankets off the sofa so he didn't know that daddy hadn't been to bed all night. But kid, kids pick up on things and he knew I wasn't right. Um, and I wasn't me, you know, I'm, I'm a glasses half full type of girl. I, I like to see the happiness in everything. And I think there is, wherever you look, you can find something good. But I wasn't, I, I was depressed. I would maybe, you know, I was trying to push myself to do things with Jay. And 
I'm not that sort of mum. I love spending time with Jay. I love taking him out to the park, to the beach, whatever. But I was having to force myself to do that because I didn't want to be out in the real world. And I was sick of putting this smile on my face, making everyone think that everything was so wonderful between me and Chris. And it, it was exhausting, absolutely exhausting. And even when we separated, you know, obviously you put it on social media that you're no longer together. And the amount of people that were saying, oh, you two were so in love, you were so perfect together. And it's the age old thing, isn't it? You do not know what's going on behind closed doors. People didn't know that Chris was hitting me. They didn't know that he was making my life a living hell. But that wasn't Chris. That, that was what he was going through. And that, that's a big thing to put out there because people say, why did you stay why, for so long? And even his dad says you stayed longer than you should have done. But I did that because I loved Chris and I knew Chris was still inside there somewhere. And every now and then you would, you would get an insight into, you would see the Chris that you fell in love with. But unfortunately the bad days took over the good days. And, you know, I'm, I'm very much in talk about how we have to look, up, look out for other people's mental health. Well, at that point I had to look after my own. And it's, but it, it's something I think I'll always be judged on because people say, well, you know, they were separated. Um, how can she be sort of talking about how much she loved him? I didn't leave him because I wanted to. I left him because I had to. There is a huge difference between the two. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, for, for, you know, for, to see a personality change like that, go from one thing to the other and be, fully aware of it and, and, and sort of understand why that's happening but for that person in this case Chris to not not realize its impact or be aware of how bad things are getting to himself it's a horrendous thing to go through you know um and just to your point you know the physical and emotional abuse and and all of that like as, as you say there's, there's no, there's no excuse if you like, but he's, an, he was an ill, he was ill. This is the reality of it. He was ill. It's, as, as, as bad as those things are, like hitting you, like you said, he was, he was ill, and that's what people fail to see sometimes. And the same as on the, on the, the this, this coward crap, you know, I, you said uh, you, you know, you couldn't do something like that kill yourself i think all of us when we're in a, a, um, a decent frame of mind we all think that but and there's so many examples of i mean you know look at chris the when you think about this what must be going on in someone's mind to drive them to take their own life it it brings me to tears thinking about it because the pain they must be experiencing yeah you can't even describe it <clears throat> you know <clears throat> it must be just horrendous for someone to be driven to take their own life like that. What and, pain and must be going through in their mind? And, and thankfully, it's something that a lot of us will never, will never go through. We'll, we'll never be that low. Um, and it, this, this is what I was saying about how he was feeling. You know, it, it breaks my heart because the Chris I fell in love with was funny. He was always joking. It, the banter that used to come out of his mouth was amazing. I mean, he had no filter. You had to be so careful over where you took him because PC just wasn't in his vocab. But he was Chris and he could get away with it with this cheeky little smile. And he, he had the gift of the gab. But the man I walked, well, I didn't walk away from him, the man I left in 2015 was not that man. And that, that's how PTSD had taken over his life. It had taken over every aspect of his life. And the only, it's not saving grace, but, you know, when I, when I went up to the house and my mum came up with me, bless her, and 
to walk into that house, we got this house, it was our dream house. It was where we were going to settle down, where we were going to spend the rest of our lives. And I walked in and what he'd, what he'd done, he'd, there were still photos of me on the wall, which I found quite ironic considering this other woman was pretty much living there. I mean, something, there must be a switch in your mind that says this, this isn't right, there's something wrong, his, his wife is still on the wall. But what he'd done was um, move a photo of the three of us, of me, him and Jay, so that it was the last thing he ever saw. And yeah, I, I take it, some days I take comfort from that, and other days I think, well, why the fuck didn't you pick up the phone and ring me? Excuse my French. But, and other people have said to me, you know, he didn't reach out to you because you would have forced his hand. You know, I, I would have phoned the police and got the police around there. We had mates in the village, I would have phoned them and got them around there. But would I have only been delaying it as well? I mean, he was, he was obviously determined in what he wanted to do, because otherwise he wouldn't have gone through with it. But what's to say if, we, if someone had phoned the police or whoever, what's to say that he wouldn't have got the help that he so desperately needed? And then he would have had coping mechanisms. He would have had a support network around him. But we'll never know. And although I say I'm, I'm not bitter, I've for, forgiven Chris everything, I can't forgive that woman. Sorry. Sorry. What, uh, what was the situation at work leading up to his death? And those sort of things. Because he was still serving, right? No, no, he'd been out, he took redundancy. Oh, I didn't realise, okay. Yeah, um, so he was working on Civic Street as a chef. Um, at, I don't really know what was going on in his head. He was in so much debt. That was the one thing I noticed. Um, obviously, when we went into the house, there was a cardboard box full of unopened letters of just debt. You know, bailiffs were coming around, all sorts. When I sat down and went through it all, I think he was upwards of £50,000 in debt. But he was still living this life to the outside world where there was no problems. I mean, he had one. He hadn't paid for a car park. I mean, what, up north, what's that? It's about pound eighty for all-day parking. But because he hadn't paid it, that had escalated to sort of six, £700. And there were so many of them. I mean, he, he wasn't paying child support for Jay um, and I, I never ever wanted to go through CSA for that I wanted Chris to want to pay to help bring up our child and we'd agreed on a certain amount but unfortunately about six months down the line he still hadn't paid anything I was only working in the dog groomers at the time so literally I was only earning about four four hundred four hundred and fifty pounds a month and I needed help, it's, you know, and so I had to go through child support in the end to try and push him to help us. Um, and there was, there was unopened letters from, from them. I mean, he, he owed thousands in child support alone, which, you know, the money, the money doesn't matter. What mattered to me was him not stepping up and helping our child. Because, you know, Jay, any child, it takes two to make a child, doesn't it? it and, but I, I just think that was another sign of what he was going through. Because, you know, you, you can't live a life where you're constantly spending money, but you, you won't pay what you own. And, you know, he was taking out doorstep loans and then not opening the door for the next six months. All the neighbours said the curtains were shut 24-7. I mean, that, that can't do your mindset any good whatsoever. The windows were never open. He was six months behind with his rent. So he was, that, that was another problem he was going through. It, what was more important to Chris was paying for things like alcohol, paying for cigarettes. Because 
they were his escape route. Yeah, you lose again. You lose all that rational uh, um, handle on what's going on around you, and, and the priorities change from being the things that need to be priorities in your life to not. It's the, I mean, the, the financial things a classic example of of what can be going on with someone who who can. I'm not specifically talking about Chris here, but what can be going on with someone who who seems not great? They're drinking a lot, but they say they're yeah, fine. But and again, I'm talking for personal experience as well. Is one of the coping mechanisms can be is, is you st- you stay away from anything that is going it, that is going to bring emotional effort or or the 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 difficult but right decision. For example, not like you said you know not not going and addressing the fact that you, you, you're mentally ill and you, you go and get maybe think about speaking to a counselor for example not paying off the flipping 30 pound fine for the one pound 80 park that you didn't do then turns into hundreds of pounds this is exactly the same you know that whole financial thing it's exact exactly the same happened happened to me at my worst time everything gets switched off everything gets ignored and then what and then what happens is those things all mount up and and then it just it's all a contributor to uh, i cannot get out of this hole anymore i cannot get out of this hole anymore but then how do you solve how it goes back to how do you how can you as a put as an onlooker what can you do to prevent things going spiraling down you know down the pan i mean like in chris's case it's it has to be an extreme invasion of privacy to try and get, try and get a handle of every aspect of his life to understand exactly where he's at. Yeah, and, and, then, the, and then the big thing, is, the big thing is, is, of course, if if somebody doesn't want help, can you actually help them? It's you know they they've got to want to get themselves out of this mess. But it, again, I mean, even the debt, it, it's like going back to talking to people online it, it's an escape mechanism isn't it and it, you're trying to make out that you're this one person and by doing that you don't have to deal with what's waiting for you at home it's and but it, it's a whole new extreme of doing that isn't it it's i mean when you are not when we hear the postman we go and open the letters don't we it's that that to us is just a normal thing to do but i think when you when you step that up and your mind is playing so many games paranoia has got a bit of part of this as well and that you then you think everyone is out to get you so you're not going to open the door you're not going to open your mail because that's how they get to you is that what he was experiencing paranoia wise was he experiencing that because you mentioned um, you you suffered from it as well right yeah, it, I mean, I, I think he went through all the emotions of things like that just from watching him and things that I've learned obviously since his death. Of, of, because can can you live normally if you don't allow anyone else into your life? I think there's got to be a sense of paranoia in there somewhere or at least anxiety. I mean, and that that's only going to get worse and worse the longer you don't get help for it, isn't it? I mean, to live six months with your curtains drawn, every single curtain in the house, is it's not right, is it? There, there's something seriously wrong there. And if we see people doing that on the TV, we'll all sit on our sofas and say, yeah, he, he's not well. But yet, when it happens in real life, we're all we're all so busy getting on with our own lives, aren't we? I think that we don't necessarily notice what's going on right under our eyes. And maybe again, going back to the the woman that he was seeing, you know, why why did she not pick up on this? It's you know, she was staying there on and off. So sort of, they weren't quite living together, but they pretty much may as well have been. How, how do you think that that's normal living like that? I don't, I don't know. It's a completely different mindset that I just struggle to get my head around. I mean, when when we went into the house, it, it was filthy. 
absolutely filthy and not not just untidy it was dirty um and of course that that's another symptom of it because you just don't do the things that need doing do you but for her to live in that unless she also had mental health issues which i mean i've never met her i don't know but surely something should something should click in that something's not right when when you see someone that you apparently love living that way hmm. um what uh, you do a lot now to try and well we're doing this for example you you try and i think you said you want to reduce the stigma around mental health as you know a lot of a lot of people are, are fortunately are working towards that now which is good and i think it's improving but also to, to the sort of awareness of, of, of you know your story and what you and chris and jay went went through um what what do you think what do you think needs to happen next step wise or initiative wise to, to improve the situation it is improving gradually isn't it i think Did you yeah agree? yeah oh, they, from where we were 10 years ago then i think the change has been massive and obviously in the last couple of weeks um more and more people have been telling their stories you know to see high-ranking officers admit that they struggle i think is huge and the amount of lives they would have saved by doing what they did i, I think it's just amazing um i mean you, you know yourself you look at these officers and you think, oh, you know, they don't know what I'm dealing with. They're not going to listen to me. They're not going to believe that it's real. So to actually hear them speak out about their issues is going to change the lives of so, so many. Um, and I think we all need to keep doing it. It's, I, I will share our story for as long as I need to, to say, if it saves, if me doing this saves one life, then I would do it all over again. I mean, sometimes it's, it's painful talking about what we went through and obviously the aftermath, but you know what? I, I would go through that pain daily if it saves a life each time we do it. When, when Jay did his suicide prevention video for the army, you know, to hear, an 11 year old speak so maturely about the effects of suicide and he, he opened his soul that day and it was painful for me to watch it was painful for him to do but then the amount of messages you get saying you know something clicked in watching him speak and i've reached out and i've got i've started to get help and that's why we do it you know Jay doesn't do his fundraising to go out and win awards. He does his fundraising to help others not go through what he's going through. And I think the more that we all tell our stories and, and speak truthfully, let, let's not try and hide things, you know. If, I apologise for having tears in my eyes and I shouldn't have done. Because there's no, sh I'm, I'm talking about, you know, things that have been horrific for us. And yes, yes, I still cry over it. And I, I don't feel weak for crying. So you know what? If someone does a video and they start to cry halfway through, so be it. It just shows what an emotional subject this is and how painful it can be. But by showing our emotions to others, it will hopefully make them see that there's nothing to be ashamed of. It's natural. Yeah, I, I was very guilty of it when Chris first died. I didn't cry in front of Jay because I didn't want him to see mummy upset. Well, after a couple of months, Jay stopped crying and I, I couldn't quite put my finger on it. I, I knew he was still upset, but he wouldn't cry. And it was purely because he was embarrassed to cry in front of me. So now we cry together, you know, over the most ridiculous thing. Sometimes we'll, we'll sit down and watch Chris's favorite film. And, Jay would be sat there through laughter and I'll be sat there crying because it brings back so many flipping memories. It's ridiculous. But he now knows that it's fine to show your emotions. You know, 
he's 12 years old, he's nearly 13 and yeah, he's going through a very emotional era of his life at the moment as it is, going into teenage years. But, you know, he's so sensitive, not just to his needs, but to other people's needs. But he's now learning that that's fine. You know, he, he can come home and he's had a bad day at school if someone said something to him because kids can be kids, can't they? And he'll cry when he's telling me and that that's fine, you know, and he's when he won his soldier and honour award in front of all those people in the in the room and he just burst into tears on the stage. And for a what he was 11 then, for an 11 year old to know that that's fine, that you can cry in front of that many people and that people won't judge you, I think is also a message we have to get out there because that's only gonna help people. Sorry, I went off on a tangent there. No, 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 it's fine. No, you, you make perfect sense. I think um, great, just generally talk about the, the, the mental health, um, well, well, talking about mental health, that's, that's one, that, that's just, that's one way to help reduce the stigma, you know, we seem to, um, I, the, in the, in the past, we see, I say we, when the campaign stuff like that always seems to focus on, always seems to focus on the negative sort of worst case aspects of, of mental ill, of mental health. Um, and one of the, I think one of the ways we can improve the way we sort of make it okay to talk about is, is treating it as we do physical health, treating the topic as we do physical health. You know, you, you become physically compromised sometimes. Yeah. And if you don't deal with that physical compromise, that physical injury, it, it can, sometimes it'll write itself. Other times it'll be catastrophic and then you can't walk, you can't do whatever, right? And I think it should be the same with the mental health, you know, it's a, it's a tool, right? And we've got to keep ourselves sharp, you know, and that, yeah. that's the idea with it. All of the things that you now know about and I know about and things that we can use to help maintain a good, uh, maintain a good state of mental health or, or improve people's mental health who are, who are not, who are not great. All of the tools, you can use the same ones just to, again, keep, keep you sharp, but, in being aware of the tools that can make it sharper, they're also the ones that'll bring you out of a hole. And it's just that that body of knowledge, giving the body of knowledge to people, as you say, it's fine to express your emotions because it, well, one for yourself and two, for, for other people's knowledge of what you're going through and understanding of what you're going through, you know. And also maybe a good thing would be to, show the success stories you know not everyone that has mental health issues takes their own life it's i mean there's so many of us isn't there I'm, I'm not ashamed to admit that i've struggled with my mental health that people can then relate to those stories can't they they can't always relate to being in crisis that you would take your own life but they can relate to people struggling with their mental health and maybe if, if we see more people again it's going back to the officers and that i mean they reached out and they asked for help so maybe if we can see more people like that more of us telling not telling our stories our personal stories not like for me not telling the story of what happened to chris and the journey leading up to it and the journey afterwards but maybe to talking about how I dealt with my mental health and the triggers that bring me down and things that I do to bring myself back up again. It's, do you want to talk about that now? Some examples? Uh, well, I mean, as I said at the start, a, a big thing for me is helping others. That, that keeps my mind busy organizing things. I mean, we're organizing another charity ball and that keeps me occupied and it, it's all about keeping my brain busy for me and training my brain and constantly I don't know challenging myself to do things and and that that's why work for me is such a huge help to my mental health um and I've, I've struggled these last 11 weeks not being at work 
because I'm because I'm not keeping myself busy. I'm not physically busy. I'm not mentally busy. Whereas when I'm at work and I'm constantly on my toes trying to help patients and that, I don't know, it, it's hard to explain. If that works for me, keeping my mind busy the whole time and having to constantly be one step ahead of what, what you're going to do next. And I think that, that's why I then struggle in my downtime and I constantly have to keep myself busy. I'm constantly chasing the next project over just to keep me busy. Or, you know, our weekends are obviously before COVID restrictions. We, we were trying to, myself and Jay would try and go out every weekend as much for his mental health as mine. Because we'd be out in the front, whether it's just going for a bike ride or a walk, you know, keeping ourselves busy and that work that works for me it, what works for me will not work for everyone i've got a helicopter flying overhead two seconds can you hear that <laughs> just yeah oh okay you see it's really loud yeah okay <laughs> right sorry go on yeah so i mean that works for me keeping myself my and it goes back to what you were saying you know keeping yourself mentally fit isn't it yeah but is it what about giving yourself some mental downtime how do you how do you relax then monday that's a really good question because i'm not actually sure i can, i never completely uh, switch off i am in the i when I, my girlfriend's gonna listen to this and you talking there and she's going to be thinking you the same you the same i'm the same it's project to project it's and but the reason i ask about the, the downtime and relaxation is I, for years, I really, re I found it impossible to sit there and be comfortable in my own mind without alcohol, one, or without something to occupy my mind. So yeah. sitting down and watching a TV program was impossible for me unless I was doing a multiple other things or drinking. Um, reading a book was impossible for me. Well, I didn't have the focus to read it, put more of the paragraph anyway. But over the last, I'd say, six months, I've really tried really trying hard to give myself that mental downtime and be comfortable in my own skin doing nothing and the reason i said and the reason i'm saying it to you is like are you when you were talking about it, it echoes a lot of my, my experience with stuff and I literally two days ago I said to myself right i am not allowed to start anything new for six months so that's the that, day before yesterday i said that in my head six months nothing new nothing new because i pile it on i get a i get a gap and then i plug it with something else it's almost as if probably the same as you it's almost as if i i i, I i'm trying to have i i don't want to feel unproductive i want to feel like every moment of my time is spent is, is spent doing something productive but it, it has it has also it compromises me mentally as well. It can, it can, it just, it can. It's not healthy being 100, 110 mile hour all the time. But and I'm, I'm getting in a position now where I can sit, I can sit and watch something on TV. It's still a challenge, mind. But I'm getting out and sit and relax on my own. Nothing occupy me. And but I'm, I'm sort of relearning to love it again because you used to do it before, when you when you were serving or before you joined up. You sit down and relax and watch film. Why can't we do that now? Well, yeah, yeah. we should be able to do it. You've got to give your mind a break. It's incredibly fucking hard. Give yourself some downtime, Mandy. <laughs> and it's exhausting, isn't it? When you yeah. think if your brain never switches off, it, it's exhausting. And, and, you, yeah, and you, you pile are, responsibility in yourself as well. You pile responsibility in yourself because you're involved in the stuff. You then beholden to other people and write yourself. But you, but you, you know, you, you'll have it. You, you've, you, you, feel a sense of responsibility to get stuff done because you're part of a team you're part of a new project part of the x y and z and you pile all that effort into doing it and you can't you can't step back then because people are counting on you they're relying on you you know yeah. it's, it's, it's a site it's a it's a vicious circle <laughs> it is, and it's even things in the home you know I, I can't sit down and watch a film because i'll get up and i'll start cleaning because as soon as I sit down, I notice something that's dusty or there's a cobweb somewhere. So I have to get up and deal with that. And it's, I do my own head in. So it's probably best that it's only Jay Liverworths because he, he'll hide himself away on his PC and he doesn't have to see me constantly. And it's until you've actually just said that to me. And this is why people should talk, isn't it? Because I, I thought that was normal. I thought that's what everyone did. But 
to look after myself. I always go on about how I'm not strong myself, but I am strong for Jay because that's what we do as a parent. And that, but maybe, you know, I need to start looking after me a bit more instead of everyone else in my, my network, you know, make, even if I just take out half an hour for myself every single day, that's half an hour for me where I can make sure that I'm okay. Cause if I'm not okay, how can I look after other people? Yeah. Got to relax. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I feel, I feel your pain. You know, I, I do it. It's incredibly hard. Um, because, but because you think, oh, we're relaxing and doing nothing is counterproductive. But it's not the way I see it now. Um, the way I look at it now is okay. If I if I give myself some downtime, relax, like I ain't doing anything, laptop, phone, nothing. I'm doing zero. Then that makes me more productive when I'm back on doing whatever I'm doing because I've, I've chilled out, give my mind a break, you know. Yeah, and I look, agree. You don't look convinced. You don't look convinced. I do. I agree. <laughs> but it, it's setting my mind off now. Just the thought of sitting there and doing nothing. It's which it's mental isn't it it is mental that we cannot just sit down for half an hour it's even when i'm watching a binge watch thing like chantelle would say the superstore she said about that and that was it i just went off and binge watched it but then i miss so much because i'm not actually watching it i'm constantly doing other things while it's on so i think that yes i'm relaxing but i'm not because whether it, you're just on your phone answering someone or messaging someone, are you all right? And you just, no. Yeah. I, I am convinced. I am convinced that I need to do it. I'm not promising. <laughs> but this, this is why we should all talk, shouldn't we? Even like when you do your Zoom calls for the patrons, you know, we can sit there, we can have a laugh and joke together. And that, that is probably the only thing I do to relax is when I come on those Zoom calls. <laughs> and I just spout off every now and then and random comments but but that that's as relaxed as I get and the beard's coming along quite nicely as well <laughs> yeah um in jokes in jokes that non-patrons won't get what's she talking about beard <laughs> no no <laughs> it, it is it is it's learn to relax yeah I, yeah uh, it's hard. It is really hard. Um, but it, it's the right thing to do. You know, you've got to fucking chill out. Most people can, most people just do it automatically and, and others just forget the art really. Um, and that goes back to, you know, you mentioned about when you, when you, I think you talked about when you left and you got discharged or when you, um, when you got injured and you got ill, that, you felt what was what did you say it was you felt worthless of it i think you, you had no value with it you know? yeah it's, and and that that sort of thing it, it manifests itself again when you when you leave that value goes and and that i think that is the main thing that leads to the overworking yourself being just having to do something all of the time that you perceive to be valuable because then, you're sort of validating your own existence in a way yeah. yeah and it's going back to that identity thing isn't it and that that was the one thing i i lost when i left the air force and that's right the identity you said you lost Mandy. yeah yeah, yeah. It, and now i mean that, that was difficult because when me and chris separated i grieved for our marriage and then found myself at a point where you know actually i'm happy with myself i'd found myself again um and i quite liked who i was that when I moved back, to, when we moved back to Suffolk, I enjoyed me. I enjoyed being me again. And I found myself ready to put my big toe into the big wide world again and go out there and show the world, you know, I'm back. This is me. And then obviously Chris died. And I, I was sent straight back to day one again. I was grieving my husband. I grieved the man that I fell in love with. Um, and that, that was a long journey. And, you know, I think to myself, I often forget that we'd separated 18 months before he died. And, you know, grief is different for everyone, isn't it? Some, some people can put themselves 
straight back out into the world. Um, others, others take years. You know, I'm, I'm lucky in the respect that I think because I'd already grieved for our marriage, that, that made my grief a little bit easier because I knew I was strong enough to cope with that. Because I, I think if I hadn't found myself before Chris died, then my mental health then would have hugely plummeted. And that, that's not to say that I didn't grieve, that I'm not still grieving because I, I truly am. And, you know, that people say the first of everything is the hardest, and yes, it is. But it doesn't necessarily get easier with every year that passes. It, in some ways, I think it gets harder because, you know, Jay, as Jay gets older, he's achieving so much more with his life. And every, everything is tinged with that sadness of, you know, your dad should be here to watch this. Even, even playing a football match when he got man of a match. And you're like, your dad should be here. It should be him cheering you on from the sidelines. It shouldn't be me in minus 50 degrees. But I don't know. So it's, you know, I can't, I've lost my train of thought completely. You were saying that it, maybe it gets harder, the grief gets harder as it goes on because of that, you know, as, as Jay grows up and his dad's not there. Yeah, it, that's it. I, th I think you learn to live with it a bit more. But the more that you achieve, the longer that someone has gone, the more you achieve, don't you? And then sometimes the more you wish that that person was with you to celebrate that journey with you. And I think, you know, it, it goes back to what I said at the start, you know, grief is different for every single person. There is no manual, there is no handbook to go along with this. And, and what everyone feels is different, you know. I lost my husband, other people have lost their husband to suicide, it doesn't mean we're going through the same journey. There's obviously some similar points to that, but somebody else could have lost their child through suicide and that's a completely different journey to what i'm going through and it pe people seem to put this all into one bracket of you know they're bereaved by suicide they they're all going through the same journey well we're not it's the same as god forbid i mean if i lost my dad and you lost your dad we wouldn't go through the same journey it's a journey, a grief is personal to the person living it, isn't it? It's Jay's grief is completely different to my grief. And it, but everyone seems to, I don't know if, it, if it's to do with the stigma or what, people don't seem to want to address what those left behind are going through. You know, some, of the, some of the abuse that you get online, I mean, social media is a absolute nightmare at times isn't it it can be used for good and we've all used it for good but it's just a battlefield at other times that you know people don't live my life they don't know why i make the choices that i've made in the last i don't know 10 years <laughs> but like i said my conscience is clear i will stand by every single choice that i have made whether it it's to do with Chris or it's to do with Jay or it's to do with me. You know, nobody else has a right to judge what someone else is going through. It wasn't long ago that be kind was trending all over social media because of Caroline Flack. And yet a few months down the line, it's back to people throwing abuse at each other and then thinking that they can't be held accountable for that. But it's, you know, if, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all, or just scroll past the post, for God's sake. It, it's not hard, is it? If you don't agree, if I don't agree with something you've written on Twitter, I don't then give you a barrage of abuse on that tweet. I'd probably DM you and say you're talking a load of bollocks to you, but it's, <laughs> but you scroll past, don't you? And that, real life is being brought onto social media. But because you can hide behind a keyboard, people aren't being, being held accountable. Yeah. And you shouldn't, I mean, it's easy for me to say, but, I mean, you shouldn't take notice of that, that, that stuff. Because I was passing comments of abuse 
that's not the way though that person interacts in real life it's not a, you could you argue even say it's not a, a real fucking person doing it it's just like some some version of them on social media that are just doing something to because they can give abuse and get away with it and, and just they want a reaction absolute 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 bullshit it winds me up twitter is one of the worst places for it but it was really strange twitter yeah. I, I you know i think we've, we've spoken about this in the past but yeah just yeah just fucking ignore those do you know what i mean people don't and I, I agree i agree it shouldn't affect you but sometimes it does when I mean, if someone attacks me then that's fine you can attack me all you want but as soon as you start bringing my son into it then you see a different side of me because like most parents mothers you know, I, I turn into some sort of evil witch if someone starts having a go about Jay. And it, I, I'm quite well known on Twitter for holding my tongue and I, I can be very straight down the line, but I won't argue. I don't like conflict. In fact, I hate it. But I won't hold back if people start posting rubbish about Jay. And that, that's when people see my protective side, we'll call it. What, what could they say about Jay? What, like, example of what? What the, what, um, the, what the bloody hell would someone say about him? Well, yeah, when he did that suicide prevention video, there were all sorts of comments about how he was being used um, and how I was pushing him into the limelight for my own self-gratification. <laughs> And it's, you know, he, he's 12 years old. You, you saw him the other night. If he wants to do something, he goes off and does it, whether or not that's climbing all over the sofa or what. But you know what? Every single fundraising thing he's done or every single thing relevant to mental health, he's either come to me with the idea or the our new video. I sat him down and said, they've asked if he would do this video. The choice is yours completely. And straight away, he said yes. He was given the option the whole way through. If you want to stop, if you don't want to do this, then it all gets canned. It's fine. I mean, he, he burst into tears halfway through filming it, bless him, which is how raw it still is. And we said to him then, you know, we can stop this. It's upsetting you. I don't want to see you upset. And still he turned around and said, no, I want to do it. And that, that's the part people don't see. I don't like the limelight. I hate being in the spotlight. But if it helps Jay achieve what he wants to achieve, I will push myself out there. I would never, ever push him. It's, he has his own mind, and boy, does he use it. It's, you know, and it's little things like that. It's like they're trying to, I think people have realised that you can say what you want about me. And it, it just went straight over my head. You know, I was, I was a military copper, for God's sake. There isn't much you can say to me that I haven't already heard. It's, but so then people, they pick on your weak point, don't they? Jay is my weak link. And it's, if you want to hurt me, then that is the way to do it. And unfortunately, people do do it. And I, I just don't think, as a 12-year-old, He's done more to help others than an awful lot of adults. And I think maybe that's how people should start looking at it. Yeah. But I am biased. Yeah, well, I, I completely agree. Like, you know, um, he's an ins inspirational young kid. You know, the, the pair of you are, what you're doing. And it's it's like you can see you, you're not, you know, that it's, um, the things are difficult to talk about, right? As you said, the conversation is important. I think, and if this isn't to say that everyone who goes through something like you have should should it should be obligated to talk about it and get the message out, because for some people, it just it's just not able to do it. It's not that person. But if, if Very much you can so. and you're willing, you 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 help. You are helping people, and you are potentially saving lives. You know, you said about that. The I can't remember the name of the officer. Did, did that, was it the chief of staff? Who did that video about talking about? His, it wasn't the chief of staff, but. Talk about the and Tim Tim Broughton, Broughton, didn't he? That's right. He yeah, I, I, and I completely agree with you. Him doing that will have saved lives a hundred percent because there'll be people who will feel uh, who'll be motivated to go and seek help when otherwise they wouldn't have done it. And and if they hadn't have done it, they'd gone down that other path. They, they could be the case that they you know could take their own lives at some point or live a flipping miserable life, just horrendous. 
you know, and yeah. you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and you're right, I mean, nobody should ever feel pressured into telling their story. If you're not comfortable telling your story, then you're going to damage yourself. And like you say, it's going back to what you said, you know, it's about looking after number one, isn't it? It's about keeping ourselves mentally and physically fit. It's, you know, I d nobody should ever feel forced into going out there and saying what's happened to them. And it's, I, th I think you see an awful lot of that as well, because I'm, I'm quite vocal. Then maybe others feel that they have to, and that, that's not what I want. I don't want people to feel pressured into telling their story. If people are comfortable, then yes, go out there and do what you need to do. But no, it's the same as anything, isn't it? You should never ever feel pressured into doing anything. You either want to do it or you don't want to do it. And whatever choice you make, that's fine. You know, nobody else has the right to judge what you decide to do. Yes. I mean, I'd, as well, I do have to do a big shout out because I don't want to suddenly end and I haven't done it for Safa because you know what, you know, we talk about keeping ourselves strong and my caseworker from Safa Suffolk, Sue Cross, I mean, Chris, if we could clone her and set her out all across the country, then I think we would solve it. so many problems because, you know, for someone that I didn't know, She's since become a family friend and we, we keep in contact now. But, you know, she kept me strong because she was strong for me. I was then able to be strong for Jay. And that, especially during those early days, the early weeks, that was so, so important. And the biggest thing for me, and I say this whenever I do public speaking, she didn't want to judge Chris, not once. And that was so important for my mindset. And I mean, Safra as a whole, you know, then they organised when he did his fun day and they invited him up to London to start the Rally for Heroes and sort of got him up in front of everyone, gave him a certificate, which he thought was amazing. And then they arranged such an awesome day in London for him. He, he drove the police boat down the Thames, which, which you know, how many adults get to do that, let alone kids? Um, we had a private tour around the Tower of London with our own private beef eater. So that, and then we went to the bomb, police bomb squad. So he was playing with the robots in the courtyard and trying to find all fake bombs and everything. And you know, that, that was on my 40th birthday. So that was 2018, August, 2018. That was the first time I saw him act like a child and the proper belly laughs, the smiles and natural smiles, not because he felt he had to smile because you'd done something for him, but they gave me my son back. And that's something I can never thank Sapper enough for, because from that point on, his whole persona changed and he went back to Jay and being the cheeky, mischievous little boy, which is what they should all be like, isn't it? And also Scotty's little soldiers, because they're just amazing. I know you've had Nikki on and she's just out of this world awesome. So a big thank you to both of them, because without them, you know, they both helped Jay more than, more than I could ever get across when I'm talking about them, you know, it, it, it's more than just putting the things on in London for him. It, it's, you know, the thanks they gave him for what he did made it worthwhile for him. And it's to know that he's helped others. And they, they just keep doing what they do. Both charities are quite quiet. They're not fully in the news and you don't see them all the time, but they're both such amazing charities. And I mean, we'll, we'll support both of them for as long as we've got breath in our body, because, you know, both of them have saved our lives, not just mine, but Jay's as well, because he, he could have gone down one of two roads, I think. He, he could be extremely bitter over what's happened to him. And he hasn't. He's chosen the path where he wants to help others. And that's because of the support he's been given. Yeah, it's amazing. Shout out to Safa and uh, Scottish Soldiers. Was it Sue Cross? 
Yes. Yes, yeah, Sue Cross and uh, Nikki Scott. Yeah, amazing. Anything else that you we, you wanted to bring up that we haven't covered yet before we finish? I don't off? know. I think I've gone off on too many tangents. That's, that's all right. It's my style. <laughs> that's my style too. So I did all over the place, all over the place. No, no, no you have, you, have, you haven't all. You haven't all. It's been a really, been a really interesting chat. It's been really good to chat. Now, you. now I'll be really paranoid that I come across like a complete douchebag. Uh, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. But it, it is what it is. It my story is my story, isn't it? And I mean, I haven't, I haven't gone completely into what me and Chris went through. Because I think that that's very personal to us. It, you know that there are certain things that that went on between us that I will never ever tell anyone, because that that was our life, and I don't think by sharing every second of every day that we spent together that doesn't help anyone. But what I do want to get across is, you know. I, I get a lot of messages when I message people when you see that they've put tweets or something on that they're struggling or that they've reached a point they don't want to go on and, and I will always message these people because my conscience doesn't allow me to think oh you know someone else will message them they'll be fine and what I always get back is you've got too much going on Mandy you're dealing with your own own things in your own life and no, don't don't ever think that I've got too much going on. And I mean, the same with a lot of people I know. If we reach out to you saying that we're here to listen, then we're here to listen. And it's, please don't think that your problems are no less important than, any, than anything anyone else is going through. And problems are relative. What What affects me would not affect you and vice versa, you know, it's, it's relative to the person we are. So I, I get upset by the most stupid things. I, I can sit and cry watching EastEnders, for God's sake. We all know it's not real. But, and yet I can go out and I can deal with something that would really upset someone else and it won't affect me. And I think that that's what we have to remember as well. You know, you may think, or a person struggling may think that what they're going through is not important it, it, it's not traumatic if it's traumatic and upsetting you then you need to be able to discuss that if that makes sense makes absolute sense yeah makes absolute sense completely agree it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you um uh so scott is it the soldiers are oh, people know the links don't they because I've, I've had a yeah scott is it the soldiers yeah. suffer and do you want to point anywhere, anyone anywhere else links wise help wise resource wise <laughs> i mean if if you're living with someone that is struggling with ptsd then you've got the ripple pond they're absolutely they do a fantastic job okay england yeah um yeah i mean there's so so many charities out there i if if you've lost if you're bereaved by suicide you've got full of fallen that was started by joe jukes um hidden warriors is another good one i, I could go i could list these no, uh, forever veterans charity they do awesome work absolutely awesome work um but yeah i'll stop there all right listen go and uh you're gonna try and relax this afternoon aren't you do nothing yeah <laughs> I might go and dig over the garden now. Stay safe. I'll see you uh, hopefully when this stuff lifts. We'll get in, in person and I'll get you a beer or a wine or whatever it is you drink now. Wine. Wine. Cool. A pint. If I'm out with the lads, I'll have a pint. <laughs> um, thanks for everything you're doing. You're, uh, you're a star. And obviously, Jay, Jay as well. And, um, you know, you're, you're, you're helping people, what you're doing. Well, thank you for what you do because you are raising awareness in your own unique way, Hugh. Is that a compliment? It's as good as it's going to get, yeah. <laughs> Listen, have a, uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon and um, I will see you soon. Thanks a lot, Mandy. Okay, thank you.